ABC New England Northwest weather. Morning to you. I wish I could tell you there was rain on the horizon, but nothing at this stage. That high pressure system sitting squarely above us and uh, bringing us lots of sunshine. Sunny on the northwest slopes and plains, and as I said, remaining fine for the next three days right across the New England Northwest. Actually, I wish I could tell you something different. Unfortunately, because of the vastness of the drought, the only hay that's around really is in Victoria and South Australia. So for that reason, I never thought I'd ever have to, but we're having to travel 2,000 kilometres, 1,000 kilometres down, 1,000 kilometres back. I'd be joking to say that it's not tiring, and I'm a bit too old for this sort of stuff, but anyway, that's how it is. Tony Jackson didn't choose to be a truck driver. But this drought has redefined his world. It stripped the entire state of New South Wales of feed. Tony Jackson is just back from his 17th trip to Victoria carting hay. It's a 12-hour drive each way. How you going, dear? <laughs> How you going, mate? How's your job? Long. <laughs> As soon as you get a couple undone him, you can start unloading this if you like. Yeah. It really hit us quick. It really did. No, it scared me. You know, I can remember looking at the cows and thinking, bloody hell, what are we going to do? And that's horrible. You know, you kind of get a bit of a tremor, you think, bloody hell. He's not young, of course. It's been really hard on him. He's finding it tough, like he, he's getting tired as you would and um, he's doing it by himself. So he doesn't have anyone there alongside him to keep him company. With Tony on the road so much, the farming is left to his stepdaughter Emma and their assistant farm manager, Jake Roots. It's been horrible. It is sad. Um, we're just trying to keep the cattle alive. So I guess I do get emotional. Yeah, all we're doing is trying to keep them alive and we got to get what we can get. Um, it's been hard trying to find the hay. This load was, wasn't was that good, but it's all hay, so... She has a passion for this land and I've said to her, as long as she looks after me in my old age, it's not going to be sold and it's hers. Emma's had it tougher than I've had. I've spent over 60 days away from this place in the last three months. In the trucks, I haven't been here a lot. Emma's the one that's had the hardest job. She's had a lot harder job than me because she's looking at the coalface more than I have. There's a punishing monotony to surviving this drought. Emma and Jake spend every day distributing feed. Right, I'll load you up, brother. Yeah. Emma is desperately trying to save the herd and her future. I'll shut these gates behind you. Yeah. It might be all day. <laughs> yeah, we have laugh and jokes and carry on. We have to or we cry. We laugh or we cry. If it doesn't rain, well, they'll run out of money. Yeah. And it's not just this farm, it's all the other farmers around us. Poor Emma, she's 28, 27 now, and she thought she would take over the family farm, and she might not, um, because of drought. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else, even though it is horrible. Yeah, it's, it's my home and I love it. day begins with the same cloudless sky and the same questions. 
you get up in the morning and go out on the veranda and have a coffee and um, you just think, what's today going to bring? How many cows am I going to shoot? What am I going to do? After just one night at home, Tony is hitting the road again. Just make sure you get some of that grape mark and try that. Yeah, and I'd nice. even, you yeah, do some with the wieners, but even take, and he doesn't mind, like, even if you get half a tonne of it and try it with the cows too. Okay, let's put it on the back of the cruiser. And... Put it on the back of the cruiser yep. and mix it up with some cotton seed when you're feeding cotton seed up there. Because yep. if it's good, we will get a load of it yep. and we'll get into it quick while we can still get it. I'll head off now and yep. I'll be, I'll do that banking in Corindoy. Yep. And I will be home. I'll talk to you tonight, but I'll be home hopefully one, two o'clock Friday. Yeah, no worries at all. You must know just about every pothole on that road. I do know a fair few of them. Yeah, yeah, I've known some of them. Yeah. Yeah, no, 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 it's fine. It's it's fine. And, you know, there's other truck drivers on the road. And, you know, no, it's all right. Well, good luck. Safe travels. OK, thank you. <laughs> good. Poor Tony, he's doing two trips a week now. It started off, he was doing one trip a week and he'd have three, maybe four days at home. Then it got worse and worse and we were feeding more and more, so he just had to keep rolling and that's what he's doing at the moment to keep up with us. Tony Jackson bought here because he believed this valley was safe. Tucked up against the Great Dividing Range with some of the best rainfall records in the district. This is what a normal year looks like. Knee-high grass and abundant feed. It's an unbelievable difference because you get used to seeing it the way it is and even when I look back at the photos, I just go, wow, that's what it's usually like. We're not the only ones, and we have to remember that. We're not the only ones that are shooting cows and feeding cows and trying to keep everything alive. Tonight, farmers from around the district are driving into the Corindai Rugby Club. They've come to hear what government assistance is now available and how to access it. Welcome, everyone, to our information evening. So be aware of how much you're using and why you're using and reflect on that. The organisers were expecting about 100, but 170 people have turned up. And when you're under periods of prolonged stress... It's a welcome break for many and a chance to talk openly about one of the toughest challenges in these hard times, mental health. Mental illness is pretty sneaky because you won't see it coming. What happens is, is as you become unwell, you tend to lose insight into the fact that you are unwell and it just becomes your normal. I think it's really important again to remember that under periods of prolonged stress, decision making goes out the window. It's so important for your farm business that you stay well. Tough times don't last, tough people do, but you certainly... Navigating the bureaucratic maze to access available financial help is also a challenge for many. Freight subsidies, farm household allowances, concessional loans are all available. The biggest message I can give to you tonight is please do not self-assess. Let us assess whether you're eligible or not. Everybody's circumstances and income and everything is different. So do not self-assess. Let us make that decision. That's the biggest thing. Thank you. I'm here to let you know what's available through the state. So we're talking about New South Wales Government and the Rural Assistance Authority. But what about the people who are ineligible for it, either because they try and get ahead by working off-farm or they build up an asset base off-farm, which is exactly that, an asset, it's not cash. What's going to be done to help all of those people? That's a great question too. Um, I suggest you ask your local, state and federal ministers. 
done yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> keep on asking. Right. So you guys need to lobby the people that you voted in to represent you. The farmers here have had some of their questions answered, but they're leaving this meeting tonight still frustrated by the bureaucratic obstacles between them and any financial help. It's a waste of time bringing a politician. It is an absolute waste of time. I started making phone calls last November and then they said there's no drought relief. And I kept it up and kept it up. So I rang them a couple of months ago. I said, now we want bulldozers. And they said, what for? I said, to bury the cattle. And they said, it's not come to that yet. I said, it has. John Hurley's property is a 10 minute drive from Corindai. He's been breeding cattle here since he was 15 years old. Like a lot of old farmers, he remembers the big drought of 1965. This one's worse. In 1965, it was grim. It was a family partnership then. And we had nearly a thousand cattle. And we had 55 die. We sent them all over New South Wales because you could move them around. And there was plenty of water. There's no feed anywhere now in New South Wales. There's nowhere to go. And now we're out of water. The whole countryside is dried up. The water's gone. There's no way out. The costs have just got us beat. Grain has doubled, cotton seeds doubled, hay's doubled. It's just not going to end. And it's just becoming unbearable. And it's, it tests a few of us, I'll tell you. John Hurley has been hand feeding his cattle since April last year. Got to stick in. You've got to go as long as you can because you can't buy these cattle. You just can't. We just keep plodding on, get out of bed at half past six every morning, go and feed the cattle seven days a week. It's a dead end and it's going to crush a lot of people. And it gets to us, hmm. all of us. But you just got to soldier on. It's not just the cattle he's fighting to save. This is a bloodline built up over decades. Every new calf is another mouth to feed. But for John Hurley, this is what it's all about. You want to know what makes me get out of bed every morning? That. Breeding cattle that are better than anybody else's. That's what motivates me, and it's been my whole life. For 63 years. Somehow we'll keep them alive. The railway in the 19th century put Corindai on the map. The town's wealth was built on the black soil of the Liverpool Plains. Now, stress, like the drought, is stealing into every corner of the community. I have seen extreme surge in severe mental health um, issues leading from um, mild, moderate to severe depression, uh, anxiety, uh, very uncertain future and long-term um, long consequences that patients express to me um, as a result of this drought. Dr Lukman Nassar runs a clinic on the main street. 
He says some of his patients are not filling prescriptions because of the cost. The bottom line comes that at the moment they are struggling to feed their animals. They are paying uh, heaps of, um, uh, there is a heaps of cost uh, to feed their animals. So they prefer to keep them alive rather than looking after their health. But it's the mental strain that's taking the biggest toll on his patients and, it seems, on him as well. A lot of farmers have told that this is the worst they have seen in 60 years. And this is, <clears throat> they have already, some of them have sold their farms, some of them have sold their animals, some of them, the animals are already dead. Some of them, obviously, they're thinking to get their kids out. <laughs> out of the school. Tough times are the bread and butter of the Country Women's Association. With Colleen Wills leading the chorus, the ladies of the Corindai CWA are mobilising. There's another $500 come from a lady who we know very well in Sydney. The CWA is distributing care packs to farmers too proud to ask. You can't really put an estimate how generous people are. And all they want is for the farmers. It's important. There's no rules, regulations. We don't have eight pages of paperwork or more to fill in. Yesterday was very emotional again. A little old lady rings me up. She said to me, I'm 92, but she said, I'm going to give you $2,000. And I thought, oh, my God, Father. And she said, you make sure all those farming women get a tube of lipstick. <laughs> and I thought, oh, my God, Father. <laughs> Drought has no respect to person, whether you're rich or poor. The important thing is to realise that country women if they're on the land themselves, they know who's hurting. They know because the price is the same for everybody. So they have been actually marvellous in um, delivering all the goods as they come to hand. We have a duty to try and maintain... Every day now, Colleen Wills is collecting and distributing donations, leading a grassroots effort to help those in need. I'd like people to realise that this wouldn't have been coordinated so well without you at the helm. You work at it night and day, and you, to, you are to be congratulated, and I'd like people to acknowledge all the work and the effort and the time you've put in to do all this, because it wouldn't have worked like this without you. Thank you. We've got to watch her. She'll stretch herself too far. I know, she's <laughs> too old to do that, isn't she? No. <laughs> <laughs> We've got that <laughs> Shoulders, you know. I suggested to the ladies our greatest need was to keep our shops open in our main street. So the idea was we went round and gave money to the shops to provide vouchers to people in need or who could benefit from them, actually to bring people into the main street and support the town. The $250 Colleen is giving to the hairdresser today 
will go towards haircuts and beauty treatments for farming women who might otherwise go without. It'll be good when we're able to give it out and we're going to add a little bit to it as well. So, oh, that's lovely. Yeah, thank so. you very much. In a small town like this, the locals know who needs it most. I wish it would rain so we didn't have to. I had one particular client this week say this is their escape. They get to come in and have an hour of just getting away from looking at dusty paddocks and poor livestock. So if we can make them feel a little bit better, the money that Colleen and her CWA ladies have been donating to the business owners in town, if we can make a few people feel a little bit um, better about themselves and know that there are people out there that care, that's just some small little gesture that we can do. Colleen. Hello, Michael. Hi. How are you today? I'm good, thanks. How are Welcome you? Welcome to Windermere. That's a beautiful spot you've got here. Yeah, Colleen Wills lives on a property a few kilometres out of town. Very peaceful. It's She's very been a community leader in the district for decades. Yeah, never a dull minute and when you live in Kroondai. Is that right? No, never yeah. a dull minute. Yeah. Mm, there was something to do. Hers is a wisdom forged from a lifetime on the land. Everything we're doing is only really a band-aid solution, but hopefully it's bringing people together to feel that we could all work together and get over these things. It's an old saying, you might be at the top of the ladder today, but one day you've got to come down. You may be on a bed of roses today, but the thorns always prick. So you've just got to pull yourself together, everyone pull together, and I'm sure they can make their town great, whether it be Corindoy or wherever else. We're all just got to work together for the good of each other. <laughs> John Webster has been selling grain and farm supplies in Corindai for nearly 40 years. There's a lot of help being given out there. A lot of people are helping people that I don't want any recognition for, you know, which is good, but it's just getting worse. You can tell just by talking to people or looking at people uh, how, how, how it's getting out of them, you know. Everybody are in limbo because... John Webster was hoping to retire, but the drought has him busier than ever, sourcing feed for his increasingly anxious and desperate customers. Today, he's taking delivery of 10 tonnes of cottonseed from the Riverina. He already has buyers waiting for it. I'm trying to buy another 200 tonne at the moment, and it's just every, every day, every deal you're doing now, you just feel like you've, you've loaded a ship, you know? because there's a lot of work in it, putting it together. You can sell it, but you've got to be able to buy it. That's, that's, that's the big thing. But everything's just, everything's just creeping up in price now too, and that's, which is a worry. Cotton seed that was selling at the beginning of the year for around $200 a tonne is now selling for over $700. Yeah, Ross, it's John speaking. How are you? John is on the phone day and night working his contacts chasing feed all over the country. We started shifting that wheat. They've done three loads from up at the ladder. So I'll let you know when we're finished and you can, then you can start again, you know? What, what, was, what else were we doing? Every week it's getting worse. You wouldn't think it could get worse, but it is. It's just got that real bad feel about it. What sort of impact is it having on the town? Oh, it's, the town is, is really suffering. Um, and the, the business houses up the main street here, Like a lot of small towns, this one has been under pressure for decades. People here can remember when there were six butcher shops on the main street. Today there's none, and a lot of the shops here are now empty. This drought isn't just drying out the countryside, 
It's amplifying and accelerating a decline that's been underway for years. Since 1911, Riley's Men's Outfitters has had pride of place on Corindai's Main Street. John Riley is the third generation of a country clothing dynasty. There's a mirror there, have a look. He knows the hat size of everyone in the district. Down a bit further, mate. That's better, yeah. Well, very often someone will ring up and they'll say, you know my hat size, please send me out such and such and a Cuba hat. And um, you generally know from repetition what their waist size is, what their jacket size is, what their hat size is. And what their inside leg measurement is. Not all the time. <laughs> <laughs> These are for the high school. All oh, right. Do you need any more, or have you got all these uh, out? Well, I've got, I've got all the ones that I want. So. Lorraine Riley joined an institution when she married John in 2005. Are you drop these over to Wayne today? Yes. There's really nothing happening in town because the money's just not there. We need those farmers to be making an income so that they can be in town and, and spending. And of course, that's um, a lot less these days. Riley's has also been given money from the CWA. I had one gentleman that told me that he only had $20 left in his bank account. And through the generosity of the CWA, I was able to supply him with a pair of jeans, for which he was very grateful. The jeans he had on the day he saw me were all ripped and torn. And the next day, he had his new jeans on. And I was very pleased to see that. Changing habits like the rise in online shopping have undercut the business. The drought hasn't helped. Riley's will shut its doors for good soon. John doesn't expect to find a buyer. Because of the drought, uh, no one's really interested. There's no business confidence in taking on a new venture. And unfortunately, On ABC Radio New South Wales, this is the Country Hour. The national grain crop is down to a 10-year low, but the crop in New South Wales is much worse than that. Less than half the normal crop planted, less than a quarter of the normal yield now expected, and it's all due to the unrelenting drought. In New South Wales, obviously, we've had dry periods before, but we've not seen such a widespread dry period right through the state, right across a lot of regions. We're heading down a line that we will probably tip towards some of the lowest production figures we've had on record. And this is the first time that we haven't had a winter crop in this area, on the Liverpool Plains, and, and it's a big area, whereas normally, you know, it's, it's, they're big crops, normally big crops, but this has just gone from that to nothing. No crop means no income for contractors like Lindsay Mabry. There's nothing to the north, and that's a thousand k's, and there's nothing to the south. And that's the first time in my, my 35, 40 years of harvesting that there's been nothing right through the wheat belt on the west. Nothing at all. Lindsay has millions of dollars of heavily financed machinery sitting idle. We've got seven machines and plus your tractors and and you employ up to nine young fellas. We're just gonna they'll be all sitting in the shed. He's now renegotiating with the bank and his sons are looking for off farm work. We didn't think this would end up like this. We thought that'll be right, we'll get through, but now there's nothing, so you might as well say two years of it been building up, yeah. What is that costing you? Well, <clears throat> probably, oh, probably half a million. Yeah. That's a, yeah, that's a big whack, isn't it? Yeah, by the time, yeah. For most people in the middle of it, 
surviving drought is a day-by-day -day challenge. Communities like Corindai feel it at every level. Today is the last match of a tough season for the Corindai Lions rugby team. This year, they have at times struggled to field a full team. Many of the players have been caught on the land too busy dealing with the drought. In a small town, in a tough year like this, rugby is more than a game. It's a unifying community event. But I think the club really provided an outlet. I think it gives them a good off the farm and also their fathers. You know, a lot of these kids, their fathers come in and watch them play, or, and mums too. So I think it gives the whole family a chance to get off the place and just forget about it for a couple of hours on, you know, a Saturday afternoon. Last week, they went down 88-12. Today, it's a different story. They enjoy themselves and they're happy. There's laughter, you know. It's all the stuff you want, you know. They're taking the mickey out of each other. There's a lot of banter. They're giving each other a hard time, but they're looking after each other too, you know. The Lions have left their best game for the end of the season. It's a much needed morale boost. I think it was just a big collective effort. I think there's been a, a lot of, uh, I guess, a bit of talk around the town this, year, this week about um, finishing the season strong and going into next year. So it's a tough time at the moment. So it's just good to have something for the town to rally around. So, yeah, very good. All right, thanks, guys. It was a great day, you know. The boys are happy, everyone's happy, the spectators are happy, you know, and I think to finish it on that sort of note gets us on a good step for the, for the next year, for the next season. The scale of this drought is truly staggering. It stretches from southwest Queensland through all of New South Wales and into South Australia. The Liverpool Plains is almost at the epicentre. The statistics for January to August this year show 2018 has so far been the warmest and one of the driest periods since records began in the early 1900s. Unlike floods and storms, droughts creep up on the country. But is drought a natural disaster or just part of life here in Australia? How much welfare help should farmers be given? And why should farmers be bailed out by the taxpayer when other businesses aren't? They're all valid questions. The farmers here will tell you the worst time to talk about drought policy is when we're in the middle of a drought. But they would also all agree that what passes for policy at the moment isn't working. There's been no analysis of what farmers have been doing to become more drought proof, where they've been doing it, how they've been doing it. So policy makers don't know what measures are going to have a tailored impact. They just say, oh, you can have some concessional loans, you can have these grants and whatever. Paul Mankerville is a local farmer and former Corindai mayor. He's also been an economic consultant with the World Bank. He says we need a comprehensive drought policy. It is critical that you get drought policy aligned with other policies for the modern era, that is climate change, energy policy, water resource policy, to stop the decline of the agriculture sector. It's sale day at the Gunnedah cattle yards. This is where the years of farming and breeding either pay off or don't. Many of those selling today felt they had no choice. As you can see today, it's very much a cow and calf yarding and um, that's particular of a drought circumstance where people are forced into a decision where they've just got to unload and that you see that today with cows that are split up with uh, little bobby calves. A total different scenario than what we'd ordinarily see this time of year. 
We've got a lot of clients that have been in the mix for 50 and 60 years on the land, and they're saying that's the driest time they've seen around here. 222, 223, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 30. Yes, bend or bread, everything right. They can be 11s or whatever the number you want them to be. This time last year, Patrick Pirtle was selling fat cattle for record prices. At 220, sets whatever not now. Today's forced sales are pushing prices down. 206.2 goes to Coal, number 10. If it goes on for much longer, what's the impact going to be? Well, I think that is where the real sting in the tail is. Like 12 months down the track is where the real hurt's going to appear because people aren't going to have the numbers to sell. You know, there's no income in the mix and that'll um, float through to all the local businesses and the whole rural community, if you like, lack of employment. Um, I see a real issue with the processing sector going forward. They're going to struggle for numbers. Um, it's created a real dilemma, this drought, and as soon as it's over with, uh, the better it'll be for everyone. On the other side of this drought, that is a positive. The people that have been able to feed and hold this stock, I think they're going to be very, very well rewarded. Always a bit of a gamble, though, isn't it? Proper gamble at the moment. The day comes when you don't know that you can source that fodder. Of course, that's where the gamble is. Emma Lawrence and her family are now trapped in an endless cycle of feeding just to keep their stock alive. You've made a decision, you're going to spend all this money yes. and all this work to keep this herd alive, why? I believe we probably should have sold some cattle a lot earlier, but um, Tony said, you know, well, what if we do hit rain and end up having a good season um, and we don't have the stock then and then we have to buy them in? Cattle prices will probably spike then. But it's a good question because at the moment we are questioning ourselves with why have we done this? Why are we feeding them? Should have we sold them? After this is over, we must be able to trade on. Now, if we'd simply sold everything, we will never be able to buy them back. And that's the decision I made. Obviously the wrong one now. If the season comes good, it'll still be all right, but this is going to hurt for a long time. Every day, they live with the consequences of the gamble they've taken. So far, they've spent nearly $300,000 on feed. But even that isn't enough to keep all of the herd alive. You never know what you're going to find up there, if you're going to find one or two or three cows that are down or already died. Because they're calving as well and just doing it the toughest. You might see one down and, you know, sort of sigh and, oh, there's another one. I think we'll uh, have to shoot this one. Yeah. They won't get up. They give up pretty well, just get down, can't, just can't get their front legs up or their back legs and just pretty well give up. There's nothing you can do, you've got to put them down humanely, so, yeah. It is very tough, like, I'm a tough looking bloke, but any bloke, I reckon, it has to do that all the time, it's going to get to them. Um, Anyone have to have a heart, and I've shot over 80 cattle at the moment. I guess mentally and physically it's challenging. Jake and I always talk amongst ourselves, you know, and I'm sure we'd pick up if each other were getting down. In the last few weeks, there have been a few showers. Some of the paddocks have started to show a bit of green, but it's nowhere near enough. Cows actually need the grass to be up a couple of inches so they can wrap their tongue around it to eat, whereas Sheep and horses can get close to the ground with their teeth and, and eat, but cows can't.
The Bureau of Meteorology has forecast the drought will continue well into next year. The chances of an El Nino, which will see reduced rainfall until next autumn, are now put at 50%. It's going to take a lot of rain to get it back to how it was. Like, we need hundreds of millimetres, not in one drop, of course. Despite the grim predictions, Tony Jackson tries to see the glass half full. As the farmers like to say, every new day is one day closer to rain. To not to get any rain until March, that's never happened in this country since white men's been here. That doesn't mean it can't, but I don't believe it will. The people of the Liverpool Plains are resilient. But after a year of drought, farmers here are dreading another hot, dry summer. If it keeps going like this, they can't afford to keep me going. 12 months down the track, I might be without a job and Emma might be without a farm. You get sick of looking at the weather, you know, on TV, and then you look at your iPad to see what the weather's going to do. But the unfortunate thing, we're going into a dry, we're going into a hot time, we're going into the hottest time of the year, and we've got no feed now, there's nothing now. That's going to be a big impact because the days are hotter People haven't got water um, and there's no feed, so time will tell. Do you think that's going to break people? Yep, I do. I think a lot of people are going to be in trouble. The fact that a property might be worth a million dollars on paper, according to the Value General, does not put bread and butter on their table today. The best way, I think, to help farmers, and that if you think people are hurting, take them a casserole, a cake, how are you? Give them a cup of coffee. There's a lot of little things you can do which don't cost a lot of money and show that you care.